Know verily that the soul is a sign of God, a heavenly gem whose reality the learned of men hath failed to grasp, and whose mystery no mind, however acute, can ever hope to unravel. It is the first among all created things to declare the excellence of its creator, the first to recognize his glory, to cleave to his truth, and to bow down in adoration before him. Baha'u'llah. We come onto this planet once only. Our life here is like the baby in the womb of its mother, which develops in that state what is necessary for its entire life after it's born. The same is true of us. Spiritually, we must develop here what we will require for the life after death. In that future life, God, through his mercy, can help us to evolve characteristics which we neglected to develop while we were on this earthly plane. Shogi Effendi. So today we're so happy to have Dr. Sipi de Tahiri, and her topic is, is there life after life? Reflections on near-death experiences from a Baha'i perspective. Dr. Tahiri has been serving as a pediatrician and associate professor at Western University in London, Canada since 2014, where she combines clinical work with teaching and research. Previously, she was a consultant pediatrician and honorary senior clinical lecturer at the Royal Hospital for Sick Children and the University of Edinburgh. She has a special interest in the areas of health, advancement of women, and comparative religion. She's conducted many courses and lectured widely on these and other topics. So with that, I'll hand it off to Dr. Tahiri. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, it's lovely to be with you again. I'm going to share some slides, if I may, with you. So this is a very um, interesting topic that has become more and more the focus of um, not only expression of experiences by individuals, but also of some scientific research. And before we uh, talk about the actual topic, I wanted to share with you some basic teachings of the Baha'i faith um, as we enter this discussion. One of these premises for our discussion is that humanity has evolved through various stages of its um, development analogous to that which a child or an, an individual goes through as it evolves through stages of infancy, uh, childhood, adolescence, and uh, finally into the stage of maturity of adulthood. So understanding traditional religious scripture in the light of this principle is absolutely essential to um, a comprehension of why previous religious, religious scriptures talked about the nature of life after death or the soul or the concepts of heaven and hell, et cetera, in the language in which they did. And we'll dwell on this a little bit longer. The other very foundational premise for our discussion is that Baha'u'llah claims to be the mouthpiece of God to the stage of the maturity of the human race. And that therefore the language which he uses, the um, teachings that he gives us are consonant with the stage of our maturity. Baha'u'llah's teachings show that reality is actually multidimensional and just not, uh, not just confined to this material and physical realm, or even it's not bi-dimensional, but multidimensional. And Baha'i teachings greatly confirm and expand on this view of reality and tell us a lot more about the nature of the soul, the uh, survival of the soul after death, much more in much more detail than the previous um, revelations of the creator were ever allowed to uh, advance. And the Baha'i teachings, again, in common with many of the um, uh, religions of the past, confirm that the purpose of this physical life is preparation for the next. And therefore, 
what we do in this life very much matters for the rest of our um, evolution and progress uh, after this physical death. And as I said, there are many, many writings and uh, very enlightened uh, insights into uh, the nature of the afterlife and the states of being, which were previously perhaps described uh, as heaven and hell uh, in previous uh, religious scripture. Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i Faith, teaches us that unless we have this unifying vision of the nature of man and of society and an understanding, a deep understanding of how life evolves for us, that we will not be able to build a sustainable civilization that we all uh, are striving for. He states that the purpose for which mortal men have from utter nothingness stepped into the realm of being is that they, that is us, mortal men, may work for the betterment of the world and live together in concord and harmony. He further states that all men, that's human beings, have been created to carry forward an ever advancing civilization. So this concept of the organic, natural, slow evolution of humankind from infancy to adulthood does not just have an individual um, or a physical dimension, but it has a spiritual as well as a social dimension. Perhaps in recent uh, decades, the last one or two centuries, people have been very focused on just the physical evolution, the scientific evidence for the physical evolution of the planet. But Baha'u'llah's teachings help us focus on other aspects of evolution of the human race collectively, which um, cover both the spiritual aspects of its life as well its as well as its social um, organization of our planet. So just as spiritually we evolved through the inf in stages of infancy, childhood, and he avers that we are now traversing through the most turbulent and in a sense chaotic period of our adolescence and are at the threshold of our collective maturity in like manner, our social organization, our social evolution has also traversed through various stages. As we know, for our um, uh, 200,000 year history, 10,000 year of which is relatively well known to us that we went through um, stages initially in our, of our family units being established, then few family unit, units got together to form tribes tribes then finally got together to form the city states as we've known that then evolved into uh, our modern nation states but that the next stage in the social evolution of the planet which is inevitable is that of the union of all the federated uh, nation states into a world um, state of uh, unified nations. Baha'u'llah also teaches us that the most influential factors in this civilizing process has been the appearance of these spiritual luminaries, these uh, educators of humanity that have from time immemorial taught us the values, fundamental values by which we are to organize ourselves and our societies. And we know that without this golden rule, which is the foundational principle of justice, of moderation, of balance, of equilibrium, of harmony, we cannot build 
sustainable societies. And every time we forget this golden rule of treating others as we want to be treated, this fundamental moral principle of life, then we have civilizations that then die by suicide and we lose our moral bearings and we forget who we are as human beings. And the next fundamental principle that Baha'u'llah therefore um, expounds on in great detail is that the gift of our creator to this stage of maturity um, of, our, um, uh, of our evolution is the consciousness of the oneness of humankind and of this little tiny planet of ours as being one common whole homeland. And so all of the teachings of the Baha'i faith, which uh, span from the innermost life of the human soul to the functioning of a global, sustainable, united civilization are covered in uh, the more than 100 volumes of, of writings uh, that he has brought. And Baha'u'llah has actually drawn this circle of unity. He has made a design for the uniting of all the peoples, a blueprint for the establishment of what uh, those from a Christian background recognize as being that of the kingdom of God on earth, or what in, uh, in modern terminology, secular ter terminology, uh, people call the new world order based on a truly functioning, properly functioning um, United Nations of the world. He has made a design for the uniting of all the peoples, for the gathering of them all under the shelter of the tent of universal unity and that we as individuals are protagonists together with our communities and our institutions in bringing about this uh, global civilization according to the design of the grand designer with a capital G and a capital uh, D. And we offer this uh, Baha'i international community that is now the most widespread, second most widespread, most diverse uh, body of people on earth uh, as a model to study. And you can access um, authentic information about what the Baha'is are engaged in, uh, in building this model uh, on this website, www.baha'i.org. So from this introduction, we go to examine some of the evidence for the existence of dimensions beyond this physical world. Well, first of all, what has attracted the attention of many people, including um, many great thinkers, as well as foremost scientists uh, in the world um, currently, despite the fact that many people turned away from, uh, from uh, the, the existence of other uh, aspects on, of life, metaphysical aspects of reality in the last couple of centuries who are, who are called materialists. In fact, many scientists have uh, now, because of the advancement of in the realm of physics, uh, are realizing increasingly that in fact, reality is a set of love relationships between various different particles and subatomic particles and, and, um, uh, 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 and um, other particles and sort of entities within the world, within the physical world, and that they are in fact abstract and cannot be described or explained uh, in purely physical terms, which is fascinating. As a result, people are uh, modern physicists are coming to the realization that we do not have only just this physical observable universe, um, that despite the unity and 
wholeness and oneness of relationships that in fact many parallel universes exist or, or what some are calling now the multiverse. Also scientists, neuroscientists and physical scientists are coming to the conclusion that consciousness is actually not a physical phenomenon that is um, present in our neurons and neurotransmitters and in molecular structures of our central nervous system, but it is an abstract phenomenon that is related to the nervous system and is using the brain and central nervous system as its fundamental and essential tool to be able to express itself in this physical realm. And then over the last 70, 60, 70 years, with the significant advances in medical science, where we have been able to uh, basically resuscitate many individuals, millions of individuals who have otherwise died, we have been able to bring them back to life and resuscitate them, even sometimes after several days. Um, and this has led to this phenomenon that has been described by increasing number of people now into the millions from across the world, from various new different nations and backgrounds and ethnicities. In this phenomenon that has now been um, described as near-death experiences and uh, uh, in short, NDEs. And this is what we're going to, to concentrate a little bit on in the next few um, slides. Of course, there are other um, evidences for the existence of dimensions beyond this physical sensible uh, uh, reality uh, of our five senses. And these are also described uh, in the Baha'i writings, but we don't really have time to go into them. But, um, but of course, many of us will have had these experiences of true dreams uh, of seeing individuals who have passed on into the next world, seeing visions um, of um, prophets, of manifestations of God, or having some prophetic dreams. This is not only described by the prophets as it were, and by visionaries, but also uh, by us ordinary human beings uh, who in, the, in their dream traverse into a realm which is outside of this uh, physical experience where they actually uh, see and experience events that will then after a lapse of a period of time uh, become true um, in exactly the same way at, as they have dreamt before. Uh, an evidence of the fact that there is a realm that is free of the dimensions of space-time. And then beyond these uh, evidences, there is of course the supreme evidence for the existence of other dimensions beyond this physical world that we're experiencing. And that is the appearance and behavior of the messengers of God, these divine educators. Some call them spiritual sons, sons of truth, the avatars, Buddhas, prophets, the great fires in indigenous terminology that have appeared and have um, a dual nature of divine um, nature as well as a human nature who have been the mediators between the creator of the universe uh, and us mortal human beings. And we will discuss this in a little detail, um, hopefully during the rest of this presentation. So those um, who have uh, done some, ex some um, observational, uh, as it were, experiments or observational studies and have become extremely interested in these near-death experiences uh, are summarized in, in these individuals that are shown here. Um, the great um, Elizabeth, Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, by the way, these are all uh, highly, highly uh, um, knowledgeable and, um, and renowned experts uh, of, uh, of physical science, of medical science, 
Uh, one of them is Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross here on the right-hand side of this slide, who really became the authority, is the, is, remains the, the leading authority on death and dying. And she has many, many books and manuscripts on life after death, on the grieving process. And she passed away, I believe in 2006, but her works are still um, major reference books on uh, the, the, the um, phenomenon of death she, she, and dying. And she looked after many children who were dying of cancer and so on and has great, great insights into, into the, uh, the experiences of the dying. And the next person is Dr. Raymond Moody, who really spent all of his career as a psychiatrist and a physician on, um, on uh, recording and analyzing the experiences of those who have had near-death experiences. And he has many, many books, the best known of which is this one called Life After Life. And there are many others, but one that I was particularly attracted to recently, uh, uh, I believe in 2008 or 2012, um, Proof of Heaven by uh, Dr. Eben Alexander, who is a uh, most renowned and top Harvard neurosurgeon who uh, was really basically not spiritual, basically an agnostic or an atheist as he describes himself, where he then had a uh, profound near-death experience as a result of meningitis, where he was basically uh, in a severe form of coma with minimal EEG activity, minimal brain activity in a coma for a very prolonged period of time for about seven days. And he, to my knowledge, has had one of the longest and most detailed um, uh, near-death experiences uh, of the afterlife. Where he, and on the seventh day, they were about to basically take him off life support. And uh, quite miraculously, he woke up and he um, regained full consciousness with minimal brain injury, which is a very, very rare event. And he, as a result of this transformative, transformative experience, he really saw it his mission to, to convey um, his experience and the, the, um, um, the depth of what he sort of experienced to the world and share it with the world. And he has indeed done so. There are innumerable uh, YouTube videos and he has written at least three books where he has summarized what has gone before in terms of Dr. Moody's work, Dr. Um, um, uh, Kubler-Ross's work, and many other scientific literature on near-death experiences. And he has uh, addressed these in this book, which I would highly recommend to all of you. And uh, one of the uh, Baha'i authors by the name of Alan Bryson uh, also wrote a very interesting book on this concept of life after death. Uh, from a Baha'i perspective and correlating these experiences uh, with Baha'i teachings, which again was an inspiration for my uh, own uh, uh, discussion with you today. And I would highly recommend that you, uh, um, that you acquire this book. So the near-death experiences in summary, summary are fascinating because there, there is a basically a core experience that most people, and there are different percentages relating uh, or to who, um, you know, uh, percentages uh, of how many people uh, actually experience and share these uh, phenomena when they return. It depends on who they were, it depends on how long they were um, uh, dead for basically and so on. So it varies, not everybody has exactly the same experience, but most people describe these core experiences. One of them is that they absolutely uh, experience a reality out of their body, out of their physical body. And in fact, when they experience themselves and their being and their existence out of the body, they all invariably state that their true self 
their real self is not their body, but it is actually what they're experiencing when they are dead. And the other thing is that they describe extremely accurate visual perception, far more um, accurate and far more real in inverted commas to what their physical eyes were able to, um, uh, to experience when they were in their body. They are also able to hear sounds and voices which are not um, confined to the room or the, the immediate environment in which their body was dead. They have, they experience these incredible feeling of peace and of love, um, this all encompassing love. They all describe this uh, uh, being of light or this experience of this universe of incredibly bright but not hurtful uh, light in the next world. Uh, those who have a, a slightly longer time, they experience uh, a life review of what they have done and, and basically a, like a movie of their life review as they pass and pass from this, uh, from this world and what's happened and what they've done and those things that uh, they may not have even realized as important uh, portrayed to them in this life review. They experience this being of light and love who welcomes them in another world, who approaches them and they get encompassed in this being of light. They uh, describe encountering other beings who uh, are either members of the family or of their family or beings that they have heard about and known about, but they haven't met in this life. And some of them are actually people that when they come back to this life, they realize who they actually were. They describe going through this uh, um, tunnel as they transition from this world through this, what Dr. Alexander described as an earthworm's uh, view, this like tunnel or dark tunnel as they emerge into the next, uh, next realm. And they experience a, a certain precognition. And interestingly, when they come back, they uh, describe this in experience as ineffable. Ineffable means that they cannot describe or explain their experience in words and in speech that we use, but they do their best within the limitations of our speech, um, of this, of the language that we use in this realm to, to best, um, uh, you know, translate their experience, but that it is utterly inadequate. Our language is utterly inadequate to, to explain adequately this phenomenon. And hence it is described as ineffable. Now, if I may ask Paymane to share that video with us. This is a video of a great thinker who, um, uh, one of the great um, top neuropsychologists who in three minutes is, uh, is sort of describing the core experience of, of those people who have had near-death experiences. Most near-death experiences around the world talk about an increased sense of spirituality after a near-death experience, by which they mean roughly a sense of connectedness to other people, to nature, to the universe, to the divine. One of the questions that people often ask about near-death experience is whether they provide proof that we survive death. They don't provide proof for other people. They certainly provide proof for the experiencer, but not for the rest of us. But there are some experiences that do provide something that's at least evidence, if not proof. And those are cases in which the experiencer encounters a deceased individual who was not known at the time to have died. One person that I know, Jack, was hospitalized in his mid-20s, and he had one nurse who worked with him every day. And one day she told him that she was going to be taking the long weekend off and there'd be other nurses substituting for her. And while she was gone, he had another respiratory arrest where he had to be resuscitated. And during that arrest, he had a near-death experience in which he found himself in a beautiful pastoral scene 
And there to his surprise was this nurse, Anita, walking towards him. And she said, Jack, you can't stay here with me. You need to go back into your body. And I want you to find my parents and tell them that I love them and I'm sorry I wrecked the red MGB. He then woke up back in his body in his hospital bed. Tried to tell this to the first nurse who walked into his room. She got very upset and left the room in a hurry. It turned out that this nurse of his, Anita, had taken the weekend off to celebrate her birthday and her parents had surprised her with the gift of a red MGB for her 21st birthday. She got very excited, jumped in the car, took off for a drive, lost control, crashed into a telephone pole, and died just a few hours before Jack's near-death experience. Now, there's no way he could have known or expected that she was going to be dead, and certainly no way he could have known how she died, and yet he did. And that seems to be evidence that something about this nurse, Anita, still persisted after her death and was able to communicate accurate information to Jack. Does that mean we live forever? Not necessarily. It certainly means something about our minds can survive death of the body, at least for a time. Virtually every near-death experiencer that I've talked to has said without any doubt in their minds that we do continue after death. No matter how they describe their NDE, they describe having existed without their physical bodies when their physical bodies were essentially dead and yet they were feeling better than ever. There's got to be more to the world than just the physical realm to explain these events. I think the ultimate question raised by near-death experiences is, what are we as human beings? Are we just physical machines? Are we spiritual beings? Are we some amalgam of both? I don't know the answers, but now I'm much more comfortable with not having the answers. I think the important part of near-death experiences is what they tell us about this life we're in now, that we're all interconnected that we aren't individual people, but we're part of something greater. Get smarter, faster, with videos from the world's biggest thing. Thank you. So there are many uh, more and detailed uh, YouTube videos and other things. So therefore, um, as C.S. Lewis said, and, and many people, of course, realize that, that we don't have a soul, we are we are souls and that we have a body. And uh, looking now at Baha'u'llah's teachings on, um, on this concept of the afterlife, in fact, there is, as I said, so much uh, that is explained in a very new and novel and interesting way that uh, unfortunately we don't have time to describe in some detail, but one of the most evocative and illustrative examples and metaphors that Baha'u'llah brings about the relationship of this physical world with the afterlife is this concept of the uh, similarity of the life of the embryo in the womb of the mother to when this baby is born into this world and then our transition from this world and our birth into the next. So in his own words, he says, the world beyond is as different from this world as this world is different from that of the child while still in the womb of its mother. And I wanted to share with you some conversation of the, um, of the embryos that are in the, uh, in the uh, womb of the mother. Oh, let me see if I can. Here's the twin embryos that are present within a womb. Okay, here's the placenta, that's the womb. And uh, this is the um, mother here, right? And this is life after birth. They are discussing the concept of life after birth. And I'm just trying to, um, <clears throat> that's right. 
get out of this so I could read with you what they say. So there are two embryos here. As you can see, the one on the left is a uh, grumpy embryo. He's very skeptical and quite narrow-minded. And the one on the right is a smiley and much more realistic and um, uh, visionary embryo who has a much more open mind. So here's what the uh, conversation goes between these two embryos. Baby one, this is the uh, grumpy embryo talking. And you, you believe in life after birth? Baby two, absolutely. It's obvious that life after birth exists. We are here to become stronger and to get ready for whatever, whatever awaits us next. Baby one, this is absurd. There's nothing after birth. What would life look like outside the womb? Baby two, well, there are many stories about the other side. I've heard that there is a blaze of light there, means the sun, an intense and profound feeling of joy with deep emotions, thousands of things to live for. For example, I've heard that we'll eat with our mouth there. Baby one, that's silly. We have an umbilical cord and that is how we eat. Everyone knows that we don't use our mouth to eat. And on the top of it, no one has ever come back from the other world. These stories are all coming from naive people. Life just ends at birth, period. That's the way it is and we must accept it. Baby two, all right, then allow me th to think differently. That's for sure, I have no idea what life after birth looks like and I can't prove anything to you. But I like to believe that in the next world, we'll be able to see our mother and she will take care of us. Baby one, mother, you mean you believe in mother? Oh, so where is she? Baby two, everywhere. Don't you see it? She is everywhere, all around us. We are part of her and it's thanks to her that we are living right now. Without her, we wouldn't be here. Baby one, this is ridiculous. I've never seen any mother. So it's obvious that she doesn't exist. Baby two, I don't agree. That's your way of seeing things because sometimes when everything quiets down a little bit, we can hear her sing. We can feel her hugging our world. I'm pretty sure that our life will start after birth. Okay. And this concept, this metaphor of the, of the embryo that is denying the existence of life after birth or life after what it considers to be its death and transition from the womb into the next world has been addressed by the great mystic philosopher poet of Persia several hundred years ago. Rumi's poem of the embryo, wean yourself. Little by little, wean yourself. So he is talking to the embryo. Little by little, wean yourself. This is the gist of what I have to say. From an embryo whose nourishment comes in the blood, move to an infant drinking milk, to a child on solid food, to a searcher after wisdom, to a hunter of more invisible game. So, describing very beautifully the phenomenon that we alluded to earlier of the evolution of human consciousness from infancy, from embryonic life to infancy and childhood to maturity and to transition into the next world. And while we are in this realm, we need to think more and more about this invisible uh, game, the invisible uh, hunt, as it were, hunting for invisible food. Think how it is to have a conversation with an embryo. You might say, the world outside is vast and intricate. 
there are wheat fields and mountain passes and orchards in bloom. At night, there are millions of galaxies and in sunlight, the beauty of friends dancing at a wedding. You ask the embryo why he or she stays cooped up in the dark with eyes closed. Listen to the answer of the embryo. There is no other world. I only know what I have experienced. You must be hallucinating. So friends, if someone tells you that, you know, the other world is just doesn't exist, that I know what only I've experienced, you know, there is no other world and that this is all hallucination, okay, then we may uh, want to bring these experiences and differences and uh, metaphors and these poems and these, uh, you know, scientific um, ideas. And of course, there are many parallels between the womb world and this world and this world and the next. We just quickly go through one or two of them because we don't have a lot of time, but I hope that this will be food for some reflection and meditation for us as we go through this, uh, through this physical life. We acquire physical attributes, hands, brain, and heart, for example, to use in this world so that we could survive happily in this world and function in this world. And as such, we acquire spiritual attributes or virtues for uh, transition and for our life in the next world. By the way, uh, my in inspiration for sharing with you these, uh, these parallels are also found in the Baha'i writings in, in much more detail than we're able to go through here. And I would uh, urge you to, to investigate and to study for yourselves. But I think this metaphor of the embryo and that Baha'u'llah gives of the world in the, the baby in the womb of the mother and this world in relation to this world and the next is a very, very profoundly logical and scientific as well as a very um, beautiful and illustrative uh, uh, metaphor. And so that's why we're dwelling on it in some detail because it helps our understanding. The fetus gets his physical food, so ingredients for growth and development from the mother, just as humans get spiritual food what the, in, in Judeo-Christian scripture is called, and Islamic scripture is called manna, the food from heaven, the bread from heaven. We get our spiritual food and nourishment and guidance from the creator, from the realm beyond. It is not um, from this world that we get food, food for developing our virtues. Once we are born into this world or into the next, we cannot return. It's a one-way street. The baby cannot return to the womb of the mother. The fetus is unaware of this world, of the exact nature. It may have some inkling, but really it cannot comprehend and is unconscious uh, of the existence of this world. Equally, we are unaware of the, uh, of the next. And we have, we lack capacity and ability and senses and tools to be able to adequately comprehend uh, the nature of the next world. We do not decide when we leave the womb and when we pass to the next world. It is a pre-programmed or a predestined phenomenon. So 40 weeks is the ideal gestation time for the embryo to get ready uh, to enter this world. And uh, for us, you know, our time of transition to the next world is also largely predestined. No matter how much anti-aging, uh, you know, remedies and, and tricks and so on we use, we are destined to die and to transition into the next world. Yes, we can prolong it somehow by some of the measures and so on, but sometimes we cannot. And ultimately we cannot. The baby depends on the mother the same way that we rely on the spiritual world for assistance and for inspiration. We are completely dependent on spiritual forces of the divine world for our existence, but we don't actually realize this, just as the baby does not realize that it is completely dependent on the mother. If the mother dies, 
the, the embryo dies, the fetus dies. If the blood supply through the lifeline is disrupted, the embryo doesn't realize it until it's too late. And if the human soul doesn't create and maintain its spiritual lifeline, it doesn't realize its effects until after leaving this world. Now, I don't know if you saw this, um, this one, how there is no direct, and this is a very, very important uh, point, perhaps one of the most important uh, points in this, uh, in this whole uh, discussion, is that there is no direct connection between the embryo and the mother, except through this umbilical cord. It's an indirect connection. It's called the lifeline or the umbilical cord, as you can see here. And equally, we have no, as an individual human beings, we have no direct connection with the next world. We are dependent on the mediators, those divine mediators or educators or lifelines that we uh, call the manifestations of God, the messengers of God, the prophets, the avatars, to, to help us connect with our mother, with a capital M, with uh, mama. If the blood supply through this lifeline is disrupted, the embryo doesn't realize until it's called it's too late and we have, I've attended many, many sessions um, where uh, it's an it was, well, placental abruption and it is an obstetric emergency and the baby has to literally be whipped out, otherwise it will completely uh, die. And it's an emergency cesarean section and it always happens at three in the morning when you're in a deep sleep and it's like a code, you know? So we have to get up and you have to uh, rescue the baby and the baby often dies, in fact, if you, don't act on time, or if it's premature, then, um, you know, too premature, then it will die. But our souls do not realize if we're not able to create and maintain this lifeline, this spiritual lifeline, it may be, it's too, it may be too late. We don't realize it. And there's no code and there's no emergency that anyone alerts us to. And then we only become aware of it when we leave the next world. And we can obviously have some consequences of this in the next world. So the purpose of life on this earthly pl plane um, is to prepare ourselves for our spiritual existence, which means for uh, uh, the next phase of our life, which is uh, evolution and continuing our, our, our purpose in the next world. So how do we prepare? How does a fetus prepare for this world? By growing brain, hearts, limbs that it requires for its proper functioning here. And how does it do it? By being indirectly connected through this umbilical cord to the mother. And how do we prepare for the next world? By acquiring virtues and spiritual attributes such as love, knowledge, generosity, compassion, justice, uh, truthfulness, and so on, trustworthiness, and so on. And how do we do this as human beings? By being indirectly connected by prayer and meditation on the holy writings of the scriptures of the world to the next world. Um, and this is an indirect connection through the divine educators that, are, if we recall earlier, uh, brought us those indispensable foundational moral values for the establishment of a uh, peaceful society, for being at peace with ourselves, for being at peace with our um, fellow human beings, for being at peace with nature, for acting justly towards nature and to the cosmos. The golden rule being the most fundamental of all of them, including many others of how we should live, our moral compass. So if someone says they don't need this connection with their creator or what we call God, you know, in indigenous spirituality, I think, describes creator, the creator very uh, much more uh, beautifully uh, than this concept of uh, the different words that we give 
in the in various languages to the ultimate reality or to mother. If someone says they don't need the creator or the teachings of the manifestations of God, it's basically like the fetus saying they don't need the umbilical cord and they don't need nutrients. It's like the little seed seeing, saying, I don't need sun rays to develop, uh, you know, to become, um, to express my DNA and become a fruit bearing tree. I don't need sun rays, I can do it myself. It's like the light bulb saying, I don't need a transformer to supply the correct dosage of electricity um, to me. Uh, I either just don't need to be lit up or I can you know, be directly um, connected or I can directly access the source of powerhouse, in which case, of course, it will blow up and be nothing, right? It will never be able to fulfill its life's purpose, which is giving that amount of voltage of electricity that it's supposed to. So these are all really illogical statements and incoherent statements, and if they're actually delusional, if we think that we do not need uh, the creator, we do not need the life-giving powers of the creator, or that we can have a direct access as individual beings to the creator, to our mother. These statements are logically incoherent, and they are actually, um, uh, they are actually uh, untrue, they are delusional. And so the Baha'i teachings, uh, similar to the previous uh, religious and spiritual teachings, teach us that death, the physical death, is actually something that we should be uh, looking forward to. Baha'u'llah says, I have made death a messenger of joy to the O son of the supreme, O son of the supreme evidence, which is the manifestations of God. I have made death a messenger of joy to thee. Wherefore dost thou grieve? Why do you grieve? I made the light to shed on thee its splendor. Why do you veil yourself therefrom? And the supreme evidence, this is the last concept that I promised I would share with you, the last evidence for the existence of other worlds besides this world is the actual phenomenon of divine revelation, the very appearance of the prophets, uh, of these avatars in the world, of these great fires that have lit up and our, our, our world, as is, it says in, in John, um, as, uh, in, in the gospel of John, you know, the light shines in darkness, the sun comes into the world and the darkness understands it not. The light comes into this world, the sun shines and comes into this world, the sun of truth, that we may have light and we may have sight and we can, you know, know where we're going. In the dark, groping in the dark, you fall into, a, into an abyss. But these sons of truth appear that we may not walk in darkness, that we may have light and life and that we may find our path and our purpose. And Baha'u'llah uh, asks us to ponder and think about this phenomenon of the appearance of the divine educators, which is very profound. He says, wert thou to ponder in thine heart. So you need to think with your heart, with your mind and heart, the behavior of the prophets of God, every single one of them, from Jesus to Buddha, to Krishna, to Zoroaster, to Muhammad, to the Bab, to Baha'u'llah, all of them. Wert thou to ponder in thine heart the behavior of the prophets of God, thou wouldst assuredly and readily, absolutely and immediately testify that confess that there must needs be other worlds besides this world. The majority of the truly wise and learned have throughout the ages borne witness to the truth of that which the holy writ of God, that means the holy scriptures, hath revealed. Even the materialists, even the materialists have testified in their writings to the wisdom of these divinely appointed messengers and have regarded the references made by the prophets to paradise, to hellfire, to future reward and punishment, to have been actuated, means motivated, by a desire to educate and uplift the souls of men. 
and consider therefore how the generality of mankind, whatever their beliefs or theories, have recognized the excellence and admitted the superiority of these prophets of God, even if they're materialists. These gems of detachment are acclaimed by some as embodiments of wisdom, while others believe them to be the mouthpiece of God himself. How could such souls, these embodiments of wisdom, which even the materialists, I have you know, all the books, even the atheists, how could such souls have consented to surrender themselves unto their enemies if they believed all the worlds of God to have been reduced to this earthly life? Would they have willingly suffered such as afflictions and torments as no man has ever experienced or witnessed? It's a rhetorical question, absolutely not. So therefore, when the manifestations of God, and these are words of his holiness, Jesus Christ, says that I am the life, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me when he says that I have come that we may have life and have it more abundantly, have a more abundant life in this world and in the next. They are not just using this as a, um, you know, as an embellished word, you know, embellishment of words of um, just for their effect. They are talking about life in its real form as it evolves into the higher realm from this physical realm. And Christ says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, physically dead or spiritually dead, yet shall he live in a spiritual realm, which is true realm. And the religions brought to mankind by a succession of spiritual luminaries have been this primary link, the lifeline between humanity and that ultimate reality, the mother, and have galvanized and refined mankind's capacity to achieve spiritual success together with social progress. And, uh, and as Arnold Toynbee, the great contemporary uh, thinker and historian of the 20th century stated, religion is actually man's attempt to get in touch with an absolute spiritual reality behind the phenomena of the universe and having made contact with it to live in harmony with it. This activity is all pervasive. It comprehends all others. Moreover, it is man's lifeline. When once a creature has acquired as man has, a conscious intellect and a free will, this creature must either seek and find God or destroy itself. There is no other way. And we can see that because we have lost sight of this, we are actually destroying ourselves. And uh, I don't think we have time to go through these uh, last uh, slides because it's already an hour. So, but the purpose underlying the appearance of the prophets is exactly that we may progress into the next world, but that we also only begin to exert our influence of our powers much greater in the next world compared to this world. And that we have a lot of work to do in the next world. We'll ju not just be hanging about you know, picking flowers and drinking and, you know, having fun. It's not just, although it's all fun, but we will be engaged in, uh, in the rehabilitation of this world and other worlds besides this phenomenon that we know. We are responsible. We will be responsible for the progress of this world and the advancement of this, of the people of this world in whatever area that we are passionate about that we will be able to use our powers of love, of justice, of creativity, of discovery, of inspiration. And we will constitute theoretically uh, for those souls who have been highly developed, the animating force through which the arts, wonders, sciences of this world are made manifest. There are many writings in the Baha'i teachings about what the souls of developed souls, of conscious, of spiritually conscious souls, will be able to achieve in that next world. It's not just an empty life of flying about, <laughs> picking flowers. You know, this we will constitute those souls who are 
uh, symbols of detachment will provide this supreme moving impulse in the world of being and that we will attain a form that best befits our immortality. But ultimately, Baha'u'llah states that the mysteries of man's physical death and his return have not been divulged, neither will they um, be um, uh, uh, you know, divulged to us and that these mysteries still remain unread and that death proffereth unto every confident believer the cup that is life indeed. It bestows joy and is the bearer of gladness and it confers the gift of everlasting life the greatest uh, lift uh, gift to us. And the reason for not revealing the next world, the nature of the next world is twofold. One is that we don't have the capacity and the ability to understand and know the next world, but for our own protection. So we're not tempted to enter the next world um, prematurely. And um, with these words, I, uh, open this up to, so, to some questions and comments. Thank you for your, um, uh, for your um, attention. And who knows, when we go into the next world from our fetal stage, you know, we hope that we will, you know, we will have a new form, that a celestial form that will be um, basically uh, unknown to us. But, you know, we hope that we will be very happy like this one or, you know, like this little baby who will be who looks like he's a, a real Zen, you know, Zen master. And this one looks like a little bit confused. He probably has some, a little bit of preparation to do yet. You know, he's wondering what it's all about. He didn't do his homework, you know, in this world, but these two are really very overjoyed and, and pretty, uh, pretty happy about, uh, about the next stage. And they know what they're going to do. <laughs> Thank you for your attention, dear friends. Thank you so much. That was a really interesting topic and we have a lot of questions already. So if anyone has questions, you can put it in the chat. The first question is, after we die, how long does it take for our soul to see God? If there's no time and space limitations, why does our soul need to grow in the spiritual world in order to go to higher levels of spiritual lives after this earthly life? As we are, uh, oh, so the first, the first one, I think um, that's a very deep and interesting question about um, the um, attaining the presence of God. So from my understanding, and this is important, I should have said that, and of course it was in the title, this is a Baha'i perspective. I'm sharing with you my own understanding of the Baha'i writings, that the attainment to the presence of the ultimate reality, so to God, is actually a relative statement. So we are talking about, again, ineffable principles, ineffable subjects. No one can truly say that, you know, this is a point in time, right? Because that is that realm is actually sanctified from, it's beyond space and time. And to say we attain the presence of God is not an actual absolute process or a time in place that here we are, I'm now meeting God, right? So this is my understanding that these are relative terms. Even the manifestations of God, these divine educators, as Christ said, no one hath ever seen God. And I think that's not in this realm, just in the next, not even the sun. He says, the son of God, but he hath declared him. So to my understanding, meeting God has many, many different layers of meaning. And it means, it may mean getting closer and nearer to the ultimate reality. And primarily, it means attaining the presence of the manifestations of God and attaining their recognition. And that is something that, that certainly we can attain, but attaining the actual presence of God is not a single event in time and space that we can describe. Our evolution 
Baha'u'llah in the Baha'i writings explain, is actually transition from one world to the next. It is not even as our maybe previous, um, you know, as the traditional you know, religion, uh, the previous religions told us it's going from this earth to heaven or hell, right? Or staying in heaven forever. Baha'u'llah describes that there are innumerable worlds. In fact, it, the mind boggles. That's why we're not supposed to think too, too much about that. It's like re literally the fetus trying to figure out what life is going to be like in this world. Baha'u'llah says that we, there are innumerable worlds through which we are destined to evolve. We have a beginning at the moment of conception when this, when this particular combination of, of elements and DNA you know, attracts the as unique human soul from the realm of God. We have a beginning, but we actually have no end. And we will continue to transition from one world to the next, to the next, to the next, in innumerable realms. And in each of these, we will acquire more and more perfections in the state that we are in, in the state of a human soul. And in each of these realms, we have opportunities, we have abilities, we have um, capacities that we need to continue to grow and to develop, and we will continue to evolve. I hope that that answers, uh, to some extent, the questions of the questioner. But the, the theme is a very deep one, and I would urge you to, to ponder and meditate and study. And in fact, we have to study and meditate about our mortality and immortality on a daily basis by bringing ourselves into account on a daily basis and, and pondering and meditating about the requirements of our eternal life, of life beyond the physical death. And many people don't do that and many people fear death tremendously. And one of the things that, that was not mentioned in the near-death experiences and the core experiences is that when these individuals come back to this earth, they don't fear death anymore, many of them anyway. And some people have different experiences and they get very, very sad and they get quite fearful about, you know, the actions that they've, the consequences of the negative deeds and the negative actions that they've done. And they really get transformed when they come back and they try to rethink their actions and their deeds in this world. Would you please comment on the belief by many scientists, such as Alan Lightman, that although spiritual attributes like consciousness do exist, the origin of such attributes is the physical body. In other words, these attributes are manifestations of the body and do not have an independent existence. Yeah, so these are called the materialists. And there is a great debate going on between them. And uh, I think the... Um, experience you know the scientific evidence that that I mentioned uh, particularly about uh, again increasing number of scientists and these near-death experiences which have been subject now to a significant scientific scrutiny uh, show us that consciousness is absolutely independent of this physical body and of our central nervous system and as I said proof of heaven you know by the top world world's top Harvard, Neuroscience, neuro, neurosurgeon who very much believed in consciousness as being literally a product of, of uh, biochemical um, reactions and that it does not exist outside of this physical body. Um, it's, it's fascinating. That's why near-death experiences, I think, are so interesting, described and scrutinized uh, for the last you know, 60, 70 years is, um, is uh, showing evidence contrary to those assertions of the materialists. And um, yeah, so they're beginning to realize, many are beginning to realize that in fact, um, consciousness is, is uh, independent of the state of the nervous system of the brain and the, and the um, spinal cord. And Baha'u'llah describes this actually in some detail and people asked him this question you will find several passages in the gleanings. And he says that, yes, consciousness is absolutely independent and the human soul is independent of the infirmities of the body or mind. That's uh, important. Um, so I think 
where the mind lives. The mind is an emanation from the soul. It's almost the mediator between the soul and the body, but it does not inhabit physically the biochemical uh, you know, brain and our, our neurons and so on. But it is, a, it is a, uh, an abstract and a spiritual phenomenon. It's rather like the sun rays being related to the sun. Again, because it is a, an abstract phenomenon, it's like a gravity, which of course exists. It's like the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, the electromagnetic force, which absolutely exist, but we cannot describe them in physical terms, but we know their effects. We know their effects and we can experience their effects. And so it's the same with, uh, with consciousness. We see its effects, but we also see that, you know, that, that, that it's independent in a sense of the, um, of, the, of the physical body and mind. But we have a long way to go. We have no, you know, science is really in its infancy. If you think about it, our concepts of even, you know, the physical universe are really in its infancy. You know, scientific theories are being made one day and then the next day they are being absolutely rescinded and they're being proven to be false and erroneous you know so uh, we've only had like the scientific revolution and it's just a couple of hundred years in terms of our 20,000 200,000 year history or the known history certainly over the last the recorded history of the last five six thousand years so uh, you know we are and neuroscience very much is still very much in its infancy up until a couple of hundred years ago guys we just thought that uh, you know the 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 um, whole world consisted of four elements you know fire water what was it uh, earth and air right and uh, wind that's all we thought I mean even the periodic table was only discovered very recently in terms of uh, relative to our to our known history so you know people thought the earth was flat up until three point you know several hundred years ago so it's like uh, you know we have to be really keep an open mind about this and be open to the uh, discoveries of modern science, which provides increasing evidence for the, um, for the existence of a soul, as it were, a, a reality of the human being and, and you know, mediated by our mind, uh, which are absolutely independent of the functioning of the biochemical uh, aspects of the central nervous system. Thank you. Um, the next question is about the, the metaphor you talked about with the womb and how you said, you know, life starts after birth for the fetus. So it, does that imply that our spiritual life starts after death? Um, you know, what is that? Is that what that analogy means? I think my um, understanding is that, as I said, I think in an earlier, um, uh, in answer to an earlier question, uh, to an earlier question, that um, the spiritual life of man begins at conception, at the moment when this particular combination of DNA, basically this combination of atoms, molecules, elements, right, uh, which is very similar to other forms of life, right? Other animals and other forms of life, our DNA is very close to other forms of being, but there is yet a fundamental difference that you know this specific combination of elements attracts to itself this in the physical realm attracts to itself the human a, a soul a human soul from the realm of god and that this soul is associated with this body throughout its physical realm so whether that is a 14-day embryo you know, whether it is a tiny little conceptus, you know, like a zygote that we saw, you know, I didn't show you the pictures um, of what a human being looks like. It looks like a little golf ball or, you know, two celled sort of few celled organism, right? The spiritual life begins at the moment of conception. And that spirit is associated with that unique body, okay? from that moment onwards and the spiritual life starts at that time and as the baby develops in the womb the mother as it is grown you know 
is born in this world and so on. This spirit is independent of this, of this little body, but it is associated with it. It's identified with this unique soul. And it has all the spiritual capacities and talents and faculties potentially within it, you know, but as this baby grows and develops and is educated, hopefully with proper education, with proper food and nourishment from this world, as well as spiritual education, as well as physical education for the development of its mind and intellectual faculties. As this baby receives these three forms of inter in education and training, including and nourishment, including physical nourishment, intellectual nourishment in the forms of arts and sciences, and most importantly, actually, in a sense, it's spiritual and moral education, values education, then the capacities and talents of this soul of man are able to, to uh, blossom and to express themselves in this physical realm. So the two are connected, okay, in this physical realm. And the purpose is that then after a while, okay, this material world is like a workshop, is like a physical workshop where we acquire those spiritual skills together with you know, our physical, um, uh, using our physical faculties, using our, you know, our body and the, the um, tools of this physical realm in this, in this material world to develop those spiritual limbs and organs that are necessary for our proper functioning and survival after the senescence and the disintegration of this physical world, which we call death, that moment when we transition from this world to the next. So spiritual life does not begin in the next world is my understanding. Spiritual life begins at the moment of conception of the embryo. And it acquires certain tools and capacities, blossoms, uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, its talents, its faculties in this world, and it continues then to evolve in another realm and in another form and beyond and forever. Thank you. Um, if as the video claims there's life after the actual death of the body, then wouldn't the return to life to the death, dead body amount to reincarnation? Okay, so that's an interesting question. And again, the Baha'i writings discuss this concept of reincarnation. Um, quite uh, quite extensively and and quite logically so this reincarnation concept of reincarnation means that a certain soul is incarnated means it becomes associated karna means flesh right so reincarnation uh, as is understood in in um, whether it's the theosophists or whether it's you know it stems from um, sort of the far eastern spiritual um, uh, sort of scripture, which I believe has been actually misunderstood if you actually look at that, the concept. But many theories of reincarnation has developed as a result of the uh, interpretation or what in my opinion is a misinterpretation of, of previous um, religious scriptures, particularly in the Far East. Um, that the, the uh, and there are, as I said, several theories of reincarnation is that after this, there is a soul associated with a certain body, whether it's at conception or at birth. And then once a human being dies, that soul then goes up into another realm and then it is associated with another body, right? So reincarna, karna is flesh. It is, it is associated with another physical body of another baby that is conceived, okay? And it comes and then that process goes on. So one soul goes, um, goes, you know, one soul with one body is associated until the moment of death of that body. Then it goes around and then comes back again into this realm and is associated with different bodies ad infinitum or with some, as some say, some reincarnation theories say that you either come back, you know, 
that soul, if it's been a bad, bad person, that soul comes back in lower forms of life, cockroaches and mosquitoes and rats and things which are useless and you want to kill them and get rid of them, right? Carry diseases, etc. Some other theories of reincarnation say that, um, you know, if that person's been good, right? When they get, um, uh, when they die, that soul comes back into a, another rich human being, for example, into a Maharaja or something, some really lucky, you know, wealthy, good looking, whatever, healthy person, okay? But if they've done um, bad things, they'll come back into lower castes. They come back into, into people who are uh, really of a lower caste, you know, of, uh, of beings and so on, until they learn to be good. And then it comes back and through these cycles, cycles, cycles. And then every time they try to try to improve themselves, improve themselves until they come back as a Maharaja, or a very you know, wealthy, good, handsome, wonderful person until they get released from, they become so good that they don't have to come back again. So there are so many different theories of reincarnation. This concept of the near-death experiences is not reincarnation because you're not getting one soul back into a different body. This soul is literally has the capacity to, uh, you know, for, for some time, to experience the other world, to almost transition to the other world, but their time is not yet because we've, re, you know, the science of medicine has advanced. So we resuscitate people. So they come back to this realm and they're reassociated with their old body, one body, one soul. This is not reincarnation. This is just, it's like uh, also dreams, you know, when you have prophetic dreams or you know, of seeing someone, again, that soul has not, um, you know, like gone to somebody else or reincarnated. It is associated with you, but it has the freedom to traverse into another realm for a temporary period of time, for a brief period of time. Very different from the concept of reincarnation. Got it. Thank you. Um, it looks like that's all the time we have. So thank you so much again, Dr. Tahiri, for this really interesting talk. Um, and thanks everyone for your questions. Very welcome. It's been a pleasure as always to be with you. Take care and thank you for this uh, opportunity. Thank you. Bye-bye. Our speaker next week will be Dr. Jenna Khodadad, and she'll be talking about the banishment and exile of Baha'u'llah toward Baghdad, Constantinople, and beyond. So again, these talks are every Saturday at noon Eastern time, and I've put the link to our mailing list and our YouTube channel in the chat. Thanks, everyone, and see you next week. Bye.